This is a very simple history of the submarine before they became complicated and sophisticated, which was pretty much around the commencement of the First World War. The concept of underwater combat has roots deep in antiquity, and the first known military use was during the Athenian siege of Syracuse in Sicily in 415 to 413 BC. Divers from Athens apparently used hollow reeds to help them breathe underwater, and you can see them here when they were clearing rocks which had been placed in the Syracuse harbour to damage their boats. Then, only 40 years later, this is a stone carving of another battle when the city of Thebes attacked the city of Sparta in Greece in 371 BC. It illustrates the attacking Theban swimmers using pigs' bladders to supply air when they were underwater. You can see the two swimmers at the bottom of this picture with their pigs' bladders. And this is a detail from a drawing of that battle. Then there are legends from around only 50 years later in 323 BC when Alexander the Great apparently used a primitive submersible in the form of a glass diving bell, which was depicted in this Islamic painting. This is another very imaginative painting of the same event. In this illustration, he even appears to have taken his pet cat and a cockerel underwater with him. It also looks as though he's entrusted his wife to hold onto the rope, so he was a very brave man. And this appears to be more of a glass tube than a bottle, so I'm not sure how Alexander managed to get in and out of this one. And here we have an unusual fish passing his submarine and also, strangely, people blowing trumpets as well as two dogs and a sheep shown deep down in the water. These were, of course, simply legends, and there's no proof that this event ever actually occurred. But obviously, the ideas were there. In more recent times, in 1562, according to a report published by an Arab called Tabir al Tesea, two Greek gentlemen used what was described as a large kettle to submerge and then resurface in the River Tagus near to the city of Toledo in Spain. They apparently dived several times in the presence of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, without getting wet and with the flame they carried in their hands still alight when they resurfaced. Whatever vessel they used was probably something fairly similar to this large pot. There were various plans for submersibles or submarines during the Middle Ages, and an Englishman called William Bourne, who was actually an innkeeper, but he was also a man of ideas, produced one of the first drawings of a submarine in 1578. It was intended to be a completely enclosed boat that could be submerged and then rowed beneath the surface. It was to be a wooden vessel sheathed in waterproof leather, and it would be submerged by turning adjustable screw plungers pressed against flexible leather bags located at the sides of the vessel. His idea was to increase or decrease the volume of water in those bags, and so to adjust the buoyancy of the craft. The mast was to be hollow to allow air to enter. However, there's no evidence that this submarine was ever built, and his drawing has no obvious accommodation for any crew. So, that was in 1578. Only 18 years later, in 1596, a Scottish mathematician called John Napier, who was actually the chap who introduced logarithms and also normalised the use of the decimal point in mathematics. So, he was obviously quite a clever man. Well, he'd also occupied himself with the inventions of various secret instruments of war. And in a collection of manuscripts, which is at Lambeth Palace in London, there's a document called Secret Inventions, bearing his signature. And it lists various inventions for the defence of his country. These inventions include a reflective burning mirror, 
a piece of artillery, and a metal horse-drawn chariot from which shot could be discharged through small holes, apparently an early design for a military tank. He also wrote the following about his ideas for a submarine. He said, These inventions include devices of sailing underwater with divers and other devices and stratagems for the harming of the enemies, and, by the grace of God and the help of expert craftsmen, I hope to perform. It's unclear whether or not Napier ever carried out his plans, but a close friend of his called Henry Briggs, who was a professor of mathematics at Gresham College in London, and later at Oxford, and he travelled up to Scotland to visit John Napier in 1615 and again in 1616. So, the two gentlemen had a close association. Henry Briggs also knew a Dutchman called Cornelius van Drebbel, who was in the service of King James I of England. It is believed that it was because of the interest taken by Napier in the submarine that Briggs probably discussed Napier's ideas with Van Drebbel. Anyway, Cornelius Van Drebbel went on to invent and build the very first operating submarine in 1620. Drebbel was born in Alkmaar, just north of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He only had a very basic education and he was initially apprenticed as a painter and an engraver. He became increasingly interested in inventions and he eventually attracted the attention of King James I, who was keen to gather explorers, theologians, economists, inventors and alchemists around him at court. Consequently, the King had invited Drebbel to England in 1604. Whilst he was at King James Court, Drebbel demonstrated a number of his inventions. He was most famed at that time for his perpetual motion machine, which told the time, the date and the season, and it was mounted in a globe on pillars. This invention became so famous that Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, invited Drebbel to Prague in 1610 and again in 1619. Unfortunately, turbulent politics saw him arrested and imprisoned on both occasions, and it was only royal interventions from King James that eventually ensured his release and his return back to England. Anyway, it was around 1620, so that was 16 years after he first came to live in England, that Drebbel started to make his submarine, which was based on a rowing boat with raised sides covered in greased leather with a watertight hatch in the middle. It had a rudder and four oars, and also planes on each side to help it to submerge or rise. Under the rear seats, there were large pigskin bladders connected by pipes to the water outside, and they used rope to tie off the empty bladders. In order to dive, they simply untied the ropes and the bladders inside the submarine were allowed to fill with water. To surface, the crew had to use planks to squash the bladders flat, thereby squeezing out the water. The four oarsmen rowed one oar each, with the oars protruding from the side of the boat through waterproof leather seals. This is a reproduction of the Drebbel submarine, and you can see that it had adjustable diving hydrofoils on either side to help to control the dive. It just seems crazy to think of them rowing underwater. However, I suppose in the same way that you see the rowers in the university's boat race twisting their oars to flatten their blades on each backstroke, they must have done the same whilst rowing underwater. Drebbel used a floating barrel connected by a tube to bring air into his submarine. Anyway, would you believe it, but Drebbel went on to build two more submarines, each one bigger than the last. The final model had 12 oars and could carry 16 people. It was demonstrated to King James and thousands of Londoners who gathered by the Thames and it could stay submerged for three hours at a depth of around 15 feet. 
You can see the grease leather outer skin at the rear of this illustration. Air was also supplied to this large submarine by snorkel tubes that were held above the water's surface by a floating barrel, enabling the submarine to be underwater for quite long periods. Accounts from that time suggested that King James himself actually rode in the third submarine on a trip under the Thames in 1626. It was also reported that the boat could travel from Westminster to Greenwich and back underwater, completing the return journey in three hours at a depth of around 15 feet below the surface. Now, when I first read that, I doubted its veracity because the Thames is quite a fast flowing river. But I then realised that there were vast areas around what is now the East End, which in those days were marshlands and the Thames was very much wider than it is today. So the flow of water downstream, which they had to row against, would have been very much slower in those days. In 1624, a well-known scholar of those times called Constantin Eugens reported on one of these tests, and it was rather a long report, but this is what he said. With all the rest put together is a little ship built by Van Drebel, in which he calmly dived under the water whilst he kept the king and several thousand Londoners in the greatest suspense. The great majority of these thought that the man who had very cleverly remained invisible to them underwater for three hours had perished, when he suddenly rose to the surface a considerable distance from where he dived down, bringing with him the several companions of his dangerous adventure. Eugens continued, The crowds witnessed the fact that they had experienced no trouble or fear under the water, but had sat on the bottom when they so desired, and had ascended to the surface when they wished to do so. They had sailed whithersoever they had a mind, rising as much nearer the surface, or again diving as much deeper as it pleased them to do. Yea, even that they had done in the belly of that biblical well all the things people are used to do in the air, and this without any trouble. From all of this it's not hard to imagine what would be the usefulness of this bold invention in time of war, if in this manner enemy ships lying safely at anchor could be secretly attacked and sunk unexpectedly by means of a battering run an instrument of which hideous use is made nowadays in the capturing of gates and bridges of towns. So, that was Eugen's report of Van Drebel's submarine adventures all around 1620 to 1635. Drebel was without doubt the Thomas Edison of his era. His innovations covered measurement and control technology, pneumatics, optics, chemistry, hydraulics and pyrotechnics. He was even involved in making theatre props and in plans to build a new theatre in London. He worked on producing naval mines and detonators. He built this incubator for eggs and also a portable stove able to keep the heat on at a constant temperature by means of a regulator or thermostat. He demonstrated a type of air conditioning and he developed fountains and a fresh water supply for the city of Middleburg in, in the Netherlands. He was also involved in the draining of the fens around Cambridge, and he developed a predecessor of the barometer and the thermometer. Unfortunately, although seeming to have the ear and favour of the king, Van Drebel's invention completely failed to interest those in charge of the British Navy. Ironically, of course, 300 years later, the submarine would become the most feared of all naval vessels. Sadly, whilst being such a prolific inventor and engineer, Drebel was also a lousy businessman, and he ended his life as a very poor chap running an alehouse near Cambridge. The strategic advantages of submarines were set out 28 years later by Bishop John Wilkins of Chester in his treatise Mathematical Magic in 1648. He said, 
A submarine is private. A man may thus go to any coast in this world invisibly without discovery or in any way prevented in his journey. It is safe from the uncertainty of tides and the violence of tempests, which do never move the sea below five or six paces deep. It is safe also from pirates and robbers who do so infest many waters. It is safe from ice and great frost which do so much endanger the passengers towards the poles. It may be of great advantages against a navy of enemies who by this may be undermined in the water and blown up. It may be of special use for the relief of any place besieged by water to convey unto them invisible supplies and so likewise for the surprisal of any place that is accessible by water. It may also be of unspeakable benefit for submarine experiments. Six years later, in 1654, a Frenchman called Desson built a submarine in Rotterdam for the Council of the Southern Netherlands. It was the first submarine built for military use and it was specifically designed to attack the British Navy. It was supposed to be an almost submarine which was semi-submerged and it had a large wooden beam with iron ends as a ram designed to punch a hole in an enemy ship. The designer boasted that it could cross the channel and return in only one day and that it could sink 100 enemy vessels on the way. It was called the Rotterdam boat and it was driven by a spring-driven clockwork device which turned a central paddle wheel. It was 22 metres long, 3.5 metres high and 2.5 metres wide and it had a crew of four. It was assumed that it was a submarine but it probably was intended to semi-submerge just low enough for its ram to damage an enemy vessel. The tests out of water had been positive but, unfortunately, the propulsion mechanism was totally ineffective in practical use when the vessel was placed in water. The design of this submarine was incredibly over-optimistic because it was just so underpowered that when the boat was launched, it went literally nowhere and it was abandoned. In 1696, Denis Papin, who was a professor of mathematics in Paris, built two, what I suppose could be called, sort of, submarines. With his first, he used an air pump to balance internal air pressure against the external water pressure, thus controlling the buoyancy through the in and out flow of water into the hull. Papin stated that his box-shaped submarine design featured certain holes through which the operator might touch enemy vessels and ruin them in sundry ways. Papa went to London and presented his idea to the Royal Society between 1707 and 1712, but the Society refused to acknowledge or pay him for his design, which, looking at what he was offering, seems quite reasonable, but he was very unhappy and he complained bitterly about their rejection. His second idea of a submarine, which looked like this, met with some success in tests on the River Lahn in Germany. Illustrations of this submarine looked rather like a steam kettle. It was perhaps unfortunate that his ideas were rejected by the Royal Society, as he later went on to invent a successful atmospheric steam engine, and he was also the inventor of the pressure cooker. But to be honest, I'm not sure if perhaps his two designs for a submarine and a pressure cooker somehow got mixed up. By the mid-18th century, over a dozen patents for submarines or submersible boats had been granted in England, but few, if any, were ever actually made. In 1747, a chap called Nathaniel Simmons patented the first known working example of the use of a ballast tank for submersion. His design used leather bags that could fill with water to submerge his boat, but in fact it was very similar to Drebbel's ideas. A monthly magazine called The Gentleman's Magazine reported that in 1680, 
A similar design had also been proposed by an Italian called Giovanni Borelli, so that would have been around 60 years earlier than Simmons. However, there's no evidence that either Giovanni Borelli or Simmons ever actually built a submarine, but this same illustration continued to appear in various books and magazines in several variations as if it were a real boat. There were also some early attempts to build a submarine in Russia at the time of Peter III. This was a design in 1720 by a Russian carpenter called Yefim Nikonov. He sent a letter to Peter the Great telling him that he could create a secret vessel that could travel underwater to destroy cannon-equipped enemy boats. Having provided a model of his idea, he was given permission and finance to build a full-size vessel. It was equipped with fire tubes similar to modern flamethrowers, and his idea was that it would eject a combustible mixture to blow up enemy ships. Unfortunately, during the first trial, the vessel sank while Nikonov and four crew were on board, but thankfully they all escaped. Nikonov continued with further trials in 1725 and 1727, but both ended in failure and Nikonov was then charged with the abuse of public funds and he was kicked out of his job. It wasn't until almost 55 years later, during the American Revolution against the British in 1775, that a Yale University graduate called David Bushnell provided the colonists with a secret weapon in the form of an experimental submarine to use against the British Navy which they called the Turtle. It was the very first submarine ever to be used in combat. It was called the Turtle because it resembled a sea turtle floating vertically in the water. At the age of 36, David Bushnell had entered Yale College and in later life he was a teacher and a doctor. But whilst he was studying at Yale, he first of all developed a floating sea mine that exploded on contact and he then followed that with this wonderful turtle submarine intended for use against the British Navy in the American War of Independence. The turtle submarine was to be operated by a very brave soldier called Sergeant Ezra Lee. The plan was for it to be towed into the vicinity of the target under cover of darkness. Then, in the turtle, Sergeant Lee was to open a foot-operated valve to let in enough water to submerge the turtle, close the valve to maintain a steady depth, and then move in under the enemy vessel by cranking the two propellers. The one for forward movement was operated by foot pedals, and the one for vertical movement was turned by his left hand. With his right hand, he steered the turtle with its rudder. As I'm sure you will know, looking through even a small glass window usually provides a remarkably clear view underwater. So then when in position under an enemy boat, Ezra had to use his right hand to rotate the drill above his head to drill into the enemy boat's hull to attach the 150 pound keg of gunpowder, which was fitted with a clockwork time detonator. He was then supposed to use the foot pedals to crank his forward propeller to get away and finally use his hand pump to get the water out of the hull and resurface. In the early morning darkness of September the 7th, 1776, the turtle made an attack on a British ship in New York Harbour. It was believed to be HMS 8 Eagle. He tried to attach a mine to the enemy ship, but his drill may have hit an iron strap and he couldn't penetrate the British ship's hull. Sergeant Ezra Lee then became disoriented, and he soon bobbed to the surface. He was spotted by a lookout, but luckily he managed to get away. He then released the barrel of dynamite with his timer, and that soon exploded harmlessly. So, this one-man wooden craft relied on human-powered hand crank for, for propulsion. A 
pedal-operated water tank allowed it to submerge and surface, and lead ballast kept it upright in the water. This is believed to be an accurate illustration of the propellers used, and the Turtle is believed to be the very first vessel ever to use this type of windmill design propeller. Prior to this, only oars and sails were in use. So, when operated properly, it could approach an enemy ship undetected and use a drill to attach a mine filled with 150 pounds of gunpowder to the enemy vessel. The inventor and designer, David Bushnell, later abandoned the submarine project after several of the missions also failed to sink an enemy ship. But his invention earned him the respect of his fellow patriots. When later asked about the turtle, George Washington, who led the American Patriots in the War of Independence, replied, I then thought, and I still think, that it was an effort of genius. In 1781, Bushel was, Bushnell was commissioned as a captain of the Continental Army, and he fought at the Siege of Yorktown in September and October of that year. At least two USA submarine tenders have been named Bushnell in his honour. In 1787, Bushnell moved to live in France, where it's believed he then collaborated with our next inventor, who was also an American, and his name was Robert Fulton. In 1800, Robert Fulton was commissioned by Napoleon Bonaparte to design a submarine for the French Navy, and he produced this one, which he called Nautilus. This was the first really practical submarine in history. It was an all-metal construction craft. It was built at a shipyard in Rouen and first sailed there on the River Seine. Diving planes were used to assist in submerging and Fulton also experimented with storing compressed air in copper bottles to provide oxygen for his crew. Fulton had been, marginally success, been a marginally successful American artist, but he became an increasingly successful inventor. He lived for some years in Paris, and he offered to build Napoleon a submarine to be used against France's enemy, the British Navy. This is a model of the Nautilus. Fulton said that it would be a mechanical Nautilus, a machine which flatters me with much hope of being able to annihilate the British Navy. Nautilus was essentially an elongated design, similar in many ways to the Turtle, but with a larger propeller, and it also had a mast and sail for use on the surface. Robert Fulton said that he would build and operate the machine at his own expense, but he would expect payment for each British ship destroyed. He predicted that, should some enemy vessels of war be destroyed by this vessel, which is so novel, so hidden, and so incalculable, the confidence of the enemy seamen will vanish, and their fleet will be rendered useless from the moment of the first terror. After many delays and several changes in government, Fulton was encouraged enough to build the submarine which he called Nautilus, and it was built using copper sheets over iron ribs, and it had a hand crank screw propeller with four vanes like a windmill. He made a number of successful dives to depths of 25 feet and remained submerged for as long as six hours, and ventilation was by using a combination of air stored under pressure in copper cylinders and by a tube to the surface. He included 1.5-inch glass lenses in the dome, which gave enough light for him to look at a watch, and he also discovered that a compass worked equally as well underwater. In trials, Nautilus achieved maximum sustain sustained underwater speed of 4 knots and went to the then remarkable depth of 25 feet, or 7.6 metres. Nautilus was designed to carry a naval mine intended to be dragged into contact with an enemy ship. A device on the top of the dome was intended to drive a spiked eye into the enemy's wooden hull. 
The submarine was then to release its mine on a line that went through the eye. As the submarine sped away, the long line was to pay out and the mine would then strike the target's hull and explode by a gunlock mechanism detonator. Fulton was given the honorary rank of Rear Admiral by the French government, and he made several attempts to attack English ships, but all of them saw him coming and simply moved out of the way. His relationships with the French government then deteriorated. A new Minister of Marine is reported to have said to him, Go, sir, your invention is fine for the Algerians or Corsairs, but be advised that it is of no interest to France. After abandoning, and abandoning his Nautilus submarine, Fulton went on to develop what he called a torpedo, which was actually the maritime weapon we now call a sea mine. Fulton's torpedoes, or mines, were meant to be towed in position by a surface rowboat in the hope that British boats would be blown up by contacting them. Then, when the French decided not to go ahead with supporting his submarine or his mines, Fulton offered to sell his torpedoes, or mines, as we now call them, to the English. He demonstrated their utility by sinking an anchored ship with a mine towed into place by rowboat. Knowing the French had no further interest in Fulton's ideas, the British decided to pay him £800 to come to England to develop a second Nautilus for them. This was his design for a British submarine. The hull was to imitate a seagoing sloop with conventional looking mast and sail that could be lowered for submersion. Her two-bladed propeller, still hand-cranked, folded up out of the water and then surfaced to reduce drag. When submerged, air came through two ventilation pipes and internal light was from a glass porthole in the conning tower. This carefully designed boat was never built. However, the British victory at Trafalgar made his work no longer a danger and he was then ignored until he left in frustration to return to America in October 1806. He left all of his papers and the designs on submarines with the American consul in London. He never asked for them to be returned and he never referred to his work on the Nautilus and his papers went unpublished until they were discovered at the American Embassy in 1920. So he returned to America and there he soon won fame for developing the world's first commercially viable steamboat. In 1807, his new steamboat, named the Claremont, travelled on the Hudson River with passengers from New York City to Albany and back, a round trip of 300 miles, in 62 hours. The success of his steamboat completely changed river traffic and trade on major American rivers. So, Robert Fulton was another very astute inventor, engineer and designer who had been involved with developing the submarine. Thirty years later, in 1832, a Frenchman called Brutus de Villeroy completed a small submarine which he also named Nautilus in salute to the 1800 submarine created by Robert Fulton. This submarine was only 10 feet 6 inches long by 27 inches high by 25 inches wide and displaced about 6 tons when submerged. This submarine was so small that any crewman had also to be very small and they could only sit or lie down inside it. She had eight windows on top to provide interior light and a top hatch. For a propulsion, she had three sets of sort of duck foot paddles and a large rudder. And I hope you can see the paddles in the top illustration. The ship had a complement of three men. The submarine was demonstrated at Noirmoutier near Nantes, France on the 12th of August 1832 and later to representatives of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1837. De Villeroy tried several times to sell his submarine designs to the French Navy, 
value is apparently turned down every time and the project was fairly quickly abandoned. But we will return to Monsieur de Villeroy later. In 1830, there was a war between Germany and Denmark, and Wilhelm Bauer was an artillery officer in the German army. He noticed how easily the Danish navy were able to blockade the Prussian coast, and he decided to invent a submarine that could help to break the blockade. Bauer was determined to realise his plans, but it was very hard for him as he only had a low rank in the army. However, he eventually succeeded in being granted a small sum to build his proposed submarine. The Finnish submarine was named Brantausha, which translated as Fire Diver, and it was 28 feet long and weighed about 35 tonnes. As at that time no suitable mechanical power system was available, the submarine was powered by two sailors turning a big treadwheel with their hands and feet. The third crew member, the captain, was positioned at the bow of the submarine and his job was to operate the rudders and other controls. Having arrived under the target ship, the captain would reach out through the rubber glove in the front opening of the hull, grab the mine which had been located within hand reach on the outside of the hull of the submarine, and fix it to the hull of the enemy vessel. Had the Brandtausche been built to Bauer's original designs, it would have achieved submersion by filling several individual tanks with seawater. However, in the change version, which was forced on him due to lack of finance, the vessel itself had to be partly flooded with water. But this made the submarine dangerously unstable, and also to save on costs, the thickness of the hull and the power of the pumps had been greatly reduced. The first trials of the submarine took place in December 1850. Although Bauer urgently wanted to make several improvements, the military ordered the public show on 1st of February 1851. This public demonstration almost ended in disaster. After reaching a depth of 30 feet, the craft began to lay down by the stern, and as the submarine sank down, the thin walls couldn't take the water pressure and they started to crack. The water pressure proved too much for the weak pumps and the propeller wheel was damaged when the vessel began to keel over. The submarine slowly sank to the bottom of Keel Harbour. For six hours, Bauer and his sailors had to wait inside the sunken craft until enough water had seeped in through the cracks in the hull and this increased the air pressure inside the submarine and finally allowed the men to open the hatchway. As the submarine stayed buried on the seabed, the three members of the crew came to the surface unharmed. This was the first submarine escape ever to be witnessed. The sunken submarine was raised in 1887 and it can now be visited at the Museum of Military History at Dresden, Germany. After the sinking of the Brandtaucher, Bauer instantly began to make plans for an improved, larger submarine, but the German government would no longer support his plans. So finally, in 1855, Bauer made a contract with Russia and built his second submarine, the Sea Teufel, or Sea Devil, in St. Petersburg. Much less information is known about this submarine than of the Brandtaucher. It is said to have been twice as long as its predecessor, and its iron walls were half an inch thick with 21 windows in them. It had three big cylinders to hold water as diving ballast and was designed for a crew of 12. Having learned from his first boat's disaster, Bauer provided the Sea Devil with a newly invented rescue device, the diver's chamber. Through this chamber, which worked like an airlock, divers could leave and enter the submerged vessel. The Sea Devil proved to be a very good design. It made 133 successful dive runs within four months. But during the 134th dive, the submarine got stuck in the sand of the sea floor. By emptying the water cylinders with the pumps, 
The crew eventually managed to raise the submarine high enough so that the hatchway was above the waterline. The whole crew, including Bauer, was saved, but unfortunately the submarine sank back to the bottom of the sea and it was never recovered. Whenever there are wars, obviously great efforts are made to develop new equipment. So in the Second World War there was the atomic bomb and V-1 and V-2 rockets. In the First World War, the big developments were in aircraft and tanks, and also, of course, submarines. The earlier American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 was when the submarine first found success as a fearsome war machine. Horace Lawson Hunley was a lawyer who lived in New Orleans. When the American Civil War began, he joined an engineer called James McClintock, and together, as Confederates in the South, they built a submarine in 1861, which they called the Pioneer, which they intended would be used against the Unionist forces from the North. However, despite all of their efforts to build this wonderful submarine, when the Unionist forces captured New Orleans, Hunley and McClintock made the very difficult decision to scuttle a boat in Lake Borgne, which is the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico, so that it would not fall into the Unionist forces' hands, and so that was the sad end of their first effort. Honey McClintock then moved 150 miles east along the coast to the city of Mobile in Alabama, where they built a second submarine, which they named the American Diver. This is a rather indistinct drawing of that vessel. They experimented with electric and steam propulsion for the new submarine before falling back on the simple hand-cranked system with which the crew could turn the propeller manually. This picture shows their first effort, the Pioneer on the left and the American Diver on the right. The American Diver was ready for harbour trials by January 1863, but she simply proved to be slow, too slow to be really practical. Nonetheless, they decided to tow the American Diver submarine 220 miles further east down the bay to Port Morgan in an attempt to attack on the Unionist forces which were using their ships to blockade Port Morgan's harbour. However, before it could be used, the submarine foundered in the heavy chop caused by foul weather and the strong currents at the mouth of Mobile Bay, and she sank. On this occasion, the crew escaped, but the boat was abandoned. So, Hunley immediately began to design his third submarine, referred to at the time as the Fish Boat or the Porpoise. However, it was later renamed the Hunley, and that is the name I'll use in the following story. It was a sleek, modern-looking craft, as shown in this drawing, which is believed to be an accurate representation. It was designed to have a crew of eight, seven to turn the hand crank propeller, and one to steer and direct the boat, and it was also built at Mobile, Alabama. Each end was equipped with ballast tanks that could be flooded by valves or pump dry by hand pumps. Extra ballast was added through the use of iron weights bolted onto the underside of the hull. In the event of the submarine needed additional buoyancy to rise in an emergency, the iron weights could be removed simply by unscrewing the bolts from inside the vessel. It was equipped with two watertight hatches, one forward and one aft, on top of two short conning towers equipped with small portholes. The hatches measured only 16 and a half inches wide and 21 inches long, or 42 by 53 centimetres, so it was so small that they made entrance to and egress from the hull quite difficult. The height inside the ship's hull was only 4 feet 3 inches or 1.3 meters, so very cramped for the crew and the hull was 40 feet or 12 meters long. In July 1863, in a demonstration to Confederate Admiral Franklin Buchanan, the Hunley successfully attacked and sank a coal barge in Mobile Bay. Following this, 
The submarine was shipped by rail to Charleston, South Carolina, arriving on August 12, 1863. Shortly after arriving there, the Confederate military commandeered the submarine from a private builder known as turning her over to the Confederate Army. From then on, the Hanley submarine would operate as a Confederate Army vessel, although Horace Hanley and his partner would remain involved in a further testing and operation. Although the Hanley was now under the command of the Army, Confederate Navy Lieutenant John Payne volunteered to be Hunley's captain, and seven men volunteered to operate her. On August 29, 1863, the submarine and its crew were preparing to make a test dive, when Lieutenant Payne accidentally stepped on the lever which controlled the sub's diving planes as she was running on the surface. This caused the Hunley to dive with one of her hatches still open. Payne and two others escaped, but the other five crewmen were drowned. The submarine was recovered, and General P.G.T. Beauregard of the Confederate Army then took control, with a 24-year-old Lieutenant George Dixon placed in charge. On October 15, 1863, after more trials and a mock attack, Hunley once again failed to surface, killing all eight crewmen. And so, in his trial run so far, 13 very brave men had died in their attempts to operate the Hunley submarine. Amongst these was Hunley himself, who joined the crew for the last exercise and possibly had taken over command from Dixon for the attack manoeuvre. Amazingly, the Confederate Navy once more salvaged the submarine and returned her to service. The Hanley submarine was originally intended to attack by using a floating explosive charge with a contact fuse, which was to be towed at the end of a long rope. She was to approach an enemy ship on the surface and then dive under her and then surface again beyond her, causing the charge to detonate against the enemy ship's hull. However, this plan was discarded as being too dangerous because of the possibility of the tow line fouling Hunley's own propeller, or even of the explosive charge drifting into the submarine itself. Instead, a spar torpedo a copper cylinder containing 135 pounds or 61 kilos of black powder was attached to a 22 foot long wooden spar. Mounted on Hunley's bow, the spar was to be used to ram the enemy ship when the submarine was six feet or more below the surface. It was intended that the spar torpedo would have a barbed point and that it would be jammed into the target side by ramming and then the Hunley would reverse away and the charge would be detonated by a mechanical trigger attached from the submarine to the charge by a line. On February 17, 1864, the Hunley attacked the 1,240-ton United States Navy steam-powered and wooden sloop of war, the USS Housatonic, which had been on Union blockade duty in Charleston's outer harbour. It had been anchored about five miles out to sea. In this successful attack, the Housatonic sank and five members of the Housatonic crew died. It had been sunk by the Confederate submarine Hunley, which was 40 feet of hammered iron, hand cranked by a suicidal and very brave crew of eight men, and armed with a gunpowder charge mounted on a spar that jutted as things turned out, not nearly far enough away from a knife slim bow. In the attack on the Housatonic, and this torpedo had not been equipped with barbs, so instead of the crew ramming it against the enemy ship and then reversing away to safety before exploding it, on this occasion it was designed to explode on contact as it was pushed against an enemy vessel. It was not clear until some time later that the Housatonic had been the first victim of a new weapon of war. The ship, 
all 1,240 tons of her went to the bottom only five minutes after the attack. Following the sinking, the crew of the Hunley were able to signal their comrades on the shore with a blue light to indicate that they had been successful. However, the Hunley was also badly damaged in the explosion and did not survive the attack, and she then sank, taking with her all eight members of her crew. So, that was now 21 very brave men who died operating the Hunley submarine. This is a sketch entitled Destruction of Housatonic by a Rebel Torpedo, and this was a report of the attack at the time. At 8.45 on the evening of February 17, 1864, Officer of the Deck John Crosby glanced over the side of the Federal Sloop of War Housatonic and across the glassy waters of a calm Atlantic. His ship was blockading the rebel port of Charleston from an anchorage five miles off the coast, and there was always the risk of a surprise attack by some Confederate small boats. But what Crosby saw that night by the dim light of a wintry moon was so strange that he couldn't be certain what it was. At a court of inquiry a week later, he said he saw something on the water, which at first looked like a porpoise coming to the surface to blow. Crosby alerted the Housatonic's quartermaster, but the object had already disappeared, and when he saw it again, a moment later, it was too close, too close to the sloop for any hope of escape. As the Housatonic's crew scrambled to their battle stations and fired their muskets and pistols at the Hunley, there was a huge explosion on the starboard side. Their ship sank in minutes, taking five crewmen with her. The explosion badly damaged the Hunley, and she also sank, taking all eight members of her brave crew with her. Years later, in 1995, when the area around the wreck of the Housatonic was surveyed, the sunken Hunley was found on the seaward side of the sloop, where no one had previously considered looking. This later indicated that the ocean current was going out following the attack on Housatonic, taking Hunley with her to where she was eventually found and later recovered. The Hunley was raised to the surface in the year 2000 and is now on display in North Charleston, Carolina at the Warren Lash Conservation Centre on the Cooper River. The recovery was led and funded by famed novelist and marine explorer Clive Cussler. This is as she was when she was recovered. Examination in 2012 of recovered Hunley artefacts suggests that the submarine was as close as 20 feet or 6 metres to her target, the Housatonic, when her deployed torpedo exploded, which caused the submarine's own loss. This is a picture of the interior of the Hunley after it was recovered, and it clearly shows just how cramped it was for its brave crew. They even made a film about it in 1999, starring Donald Sutherland as Horace Lawson Hunley. In the autumn of 1861, the United States Navy, so this was now the Northern Union side rather than the Confederates, began the construction of a submersible ship designed by the French engineer Brut de Valois, who I mentioned earlier with his Nautilus submarine. He had emigrated from France to live in America. The ship was about 30 feet or 9.1 meters long and 6 feet or 1.8 meters in diameter. It was made of iron with the other part pierced for small circular plates of glass for light and it had several watertight compartments and it was called the Alligator and she was designed to carry 18 men. For propulsion, she was initially equipped with 16 hand paddles protruding from the sides, which were not very effective. But in July 1862, the Washington Navy Yard had the paddles replaced by a hand crank propeller, which improved its speed to about four knots. Air was to be supplied from the surface by two tubes with floats connected to an air pump inside the submarine, 
and it was the first operational submarine to have an air purifying system with which air was properly circulated. The ship had a forward airlock and it had the capability for a diver to actually leave and return to the vessel whilst both remained submerged. The idea was that a diver could leave the vessel and then fix mines to a target and later return to the submarine and detonate them by connecting the mine's insulated copper wire to a battery inside the submarine. On the 18th of March 1863, President Lincoln observed the submarine in operation. It was decided that Alligator might be useful in carrying out his plans to take Charleston, South Carolina, the birthplace of secession. Acting Master John E. Winchester, the commander of the sailing vessel Sumter, was ordered to tow the Alligator submarine to Port Royal, South Carolina. So the towboat and the Alligator got underway on the 31st of March 1863. The next day, the two ships encountered very bad weather, which, on the 2nd of April, forced Sumter to cut Alligator adrift off Cape Hatteras. She either sank immediately or, or drifted away for a while before sinking, ending the career of the United States Navy's first submarine. This illustration is a model of the alligator. In 1864, Le Plongeur was the first submarine to use mechanical power. It was a French-made craft designed by naval officers Simon Bourgeois and Charles Brun. Rather than relying on hand cranks, foot pedals or treadmills to move its propeller, this enormous 140 foot long behemoth used a piston engine powered by compressed air which they stored in tanks. You probably know that any petrol engine needs air to operate and the air is contained in large copper tanks at 12.5 bar or 180 psi and those of you who pump your car tires up to perhaps 30 psi will understand that 180 psi is quite a high pressure you can see a copper air tank in this picture but there are actually four of them those tanks took up a huge amount of space of 153 cubic meters which is 5403 cubic feet and that required the submarine to be of previously unprecedented size. The engine had a power of 60 kilowatts or about 80 horsepower, and that could propel the submarine for about 9 kilometers at a speed of 4 knots or 7 kilometers an hour. The submarine was armed with a ram to break holes in the hull of enemy ships and an electrically fired spar port torpedo fixed at the end of a pole. So, very similar to the American Hunley submarine. On the 6th of October 1863, Le Plongeur made her first trials by sailing on the surface down the Charente River. On the 2nd of November 1863, she was towed towards Port de Barque, where her first underwater trials were planned. On the 14th of February 1864, during trials, the engine raced due to an excessive admission of compressed air and the submarine bumped into the quay and the trials were stopped. Four days later, on the 18th of February 1864, Plongeur was towed to La, La Palice in the Bay of La Rochelle where she dived to 9 metres or 30 feet. La Plongeur made several successful dives but its limited air supply and dangerously unstable structural design led it to be removed from active duty in 1872. In 1865, a Spanish political activist and inventor called Narcis Montreal Esterol, after witnessing the death by drowning of a coral driver in 1857, was inspired to build an underwater vehicle to increase worker safety. The result was the Itinio, built in 1867, which was a pioneering craft. It was 14 metres or 46 feet long and was designed for a crew of two. It could dive to 30 metres or 98 feet and demonstrated dives of two hours duration. 
On the surface, it could run on a steam engine, but underwater, under normal circumstances, such an engine would normally quickly consume the submarine's oxygen. However, Montreal had developed a steam engine that used chemical reaction to create both heat and oxygen. The engine seems to have worked perfectly well. Montreal made a successful dive in late 1867, but the submarine was later sold for scrap due to funding for shortages. The Goubet submarine was a two-person electric submarine built by French inventor Claude Goubet in 1885. Manufactured in Paris, this submarine has gone down in history as the first to be electrically powered, with a brace of cutting-edge technologies advancing previously more primitive models. The Goubet was battery-powered and utilised a Siemens electric motor to drive its propeller, and also to power a navigation light, and it measured 5 metres or 16.4 feet long. The craft weighed in at just over 6 tonnes. It was controlled from a central position, with its two crew positioned back to back, seeing out of the vessel via small glass windows. They could see up, down and to the sides to some extent, thanks to its glass prisms. After testing in the River Seine in Paris, however, the Goubet was ultimately deemed a failure because the submersal wasn't able to maintain a stable course or depth while moving forward. As a result, while some of its innovative technology lived on in later designs, the Goubet itself was quickly scrapped. A year later, in 1886, the submarine Explorer was designed by the German-American engineer Julius H. Kohl for the Pacific Pearl Company. That submarine used many technologies that are still essential to modern submarines. The Explorer was used for pearl diving off the coast of Panama, so it was designed to allow crew members to swim out of the submarine to collect pearls and then to return. Because of its very advanced design, it was capable of diving down to 31 metres or 103 feet, which was much deeper than any other submarine built before. However, its design had one great flaw. Pressurised air contained in a tank was released in the vessel to build up enough pressure inside so that it would be possible to open two hatches on the underside whilst keeping water out to allow crew members to swim out. So, they were balancing air pressure inside the vessel to equal the external water pressure. This meant that the crew were exposed to high pressure which made them susceptible to decompression sickness, which was a condition never before experienced and was unknown at the time. Today, it is a very dangerous condition known as the bends. To surface, more of the pressurised air was used to empty the ballast tanks of water. An August 1869 newspaper account of dives in the submarine Explorer off Panama reported that the vessel had achieved 11 days of diving to 103 feet or 31 metres, spending four hours on each dive and descending with a quick release of the pressure to ambient sea pressures. Modern reconstruction of explorer systems suggests its rapid rate of ascension or rise to the surface in just under two minutes caused the crew to suffer the bends. The problems of decompression do not appear to have been understood. A newspaper reported that at the conclusion of each of the dives, all of the men were again down with fever, and it being impossible to continue working with the same men for some time, it was decided, despite the experiments having proved a complete success, to lay the machine up in an adjacent cove. And here it still is, abandoned in that cove off Panama's Pearl Island. Jim Note was one of the world's first all-electric submarines, and it was the first functional submarine to be equipped with torpedoes. Launched on the 24th of September 1888, she was developed in France by Arthur Krebs, who developed the first purpose-designed electric submarine engine, the first naval periscope, and the first naval electric gyro compass. The submarine was built with a steel hull which had a detachable lead keel and three hydroplanes on each side. 
She was very successful and made more than 2,000 dives and she used 204 electric cell batteries to power her engines. She was armed with two 355mm or 14 inch torpedoes. The Argonaut Junior was the first successful submarine built by the American engineer Simon Lake. Her main attribute was that she had an airlock to allow her crew to leave and return to the vessel. She was a very small boat and the dimensions were only 14 feet or 4.3 meters long, 4 foot 1.2 meters wide and a depth of 5 feet 1.5 meters. Argonaut Jr. was built in 1894 as a prototype by Lake after he was denied a contract by the US Navy. It was triangular, made of wood and amazingly featured three wheels to keep it from getting stuck on the sea bottom. She moved along the bottom of Sandy Hook Bay with one or two men cranking the axle of the two driving wheels. With sufficient air pressure in the cabin, a bottom door or airlock could be opened and no water would come into the boat. So, without actually leaving the vessel and by putting on a pair of rubber boots, the operator could walk around on the sea bottom and help push the boat along with him whilst he picked up objects from the seabed. Simon Lake then built a much larger boat in 1897. It was a 36-foot craft powered by a 30-horsepower petrol engine. This sub once again had a set of wheels that allowed it to sort of drive on the sea floor. It also had a periscope, a diving chamber and a floating hose to provide air for the engine and the crew. Lake initially used the Argonaut to salvage sunken shipwrecks in the Chesapeake Bay, but in 1898 he used it to sail from Norfolk, Virginia to Sandy Hook, New Jersey, a 350 mile trip that has since been called the first open ocean voyage by a submarine. The journey earned Lake widespread acclaim and a congratulatory letter from the 2000 Leagues Under the Sea author, Jules Verne. The submarine became a potentially viable weapon with the development of the first practical self-propelled torpedoes. The Whitehead torpedo was the first such weapon and were designed in 1866 by British engineer Robert Whitehead. His torpedo was an 11 foot long, 14 inch diameter torpedo propelled by compressed air and it carried an explosive warhead. Many naval services procured the Whitehead torpedo during the 1870s and it first proved itself in combat during the Russo-Turkish War when on January 16, 1878, the Turkish ship Intabar was sunk by a Russian torpedo boat carrying Whitehead torpedoes. The Parel was an electric battery powered submarine built by the Spanish engineer Isaac Parel for the Spanish Navy. He was the first fully capable military submarine and the first electric battery powered submarine and she was launched on the 8th of September 1888. She had one torpedo tube and carried two torpedoes and an air regeneration system. Her hull shape, propeller, periscope, torpedo launcher and external controls very much anticipated later designs. She was the fastest submarine yet built with underwater performance levels, except for her range, that matched those of First World War U-boats for a short period before her batteries began to run down. In June 1890, the Peral submarine launched a torpedo while submerged. It was also the first submarine to incorporate a fully reliable underwater navigation system. However, conservatives in the Spanish naval hierarchy terminated the project despite two years of successful tests. Her operational abilities have led some to call her the first U-boat. Peral was withdrawn from her service in 1890 and she's now preserved at the Cartagena Naval Museum. Now we come to the USS Holland, built for the US Navy in 1898. The 54-footer took its name from its inventor, John Philip Holland who was an Irish-born engineer who was one of the most prolific submarine pioneers of the late 19th 
and early 20th centuries. The ship's armament consisted of a single torpedo tube and a pneumatic cannon known as a dynamite gun. A pneumatic cannon is typically a large calibre projectile launcher that uses compressed air as a propellant. You can see in this drawing how the gun was enclosed within the submarine and both the gun and the torpedo tube were at the front. This submarine was powered by a four-cylinder petrol engine for surface travel, but it also had a 160 horsepower electric motor to move underwater. By the time the Holland was decommissioned in 1905, the American Navy had brought six other more advanced attack subs into service. Submarines were among the most important new technologies that came to the fore during World War I. As you have now seen, work on submarines had been underway for decades, but it wasn't until World War I that they were really influential. Technologies had reached a point where hostile nations could deploy reliable fighting submarines. Germany led the way in submarine technology and production. Germany's large, long-range submarines were known as U-boats, a term derived from the word Unterseeboot, meaning submarine boat. One of the most remarkable features of the German submarine force was its pace of growth. The first German submarine entered their naval service in 1906. This picture was taken in 1908. When the war started in 1914, the German submarine fleet had grown to 36 vessels. By the end of the war, another 350 had been in service with up to 61 at sea at any one time. During the First World War, Britain had a much larger fleet of surface vessels, and so Germany focused on the production of U-boats to counter the British service fleet and to put pressure on Atlantic supplies to Britain. Initially, many British naval commanders were quite sceptical about the effectiveness of submarines, but on the 5th of September 1914, they had a severe lesson when the Royal Navy ship HMS Pathfinder was sunk by a torpedo from a German submarine at the Forth of Firth. Only 18 of 268 people on board survived. This attack came as a considerable shock to the Royal Navy which had been divided over whether it was possible to sink a large surface vessel using a submarine. Unfortunately, the Germans had another even bigger lesson to impart. The British, with their far superior numbers of surface warships, had settled down to the task of blockading the coasts of Germany, and three cruisers, Cressy, Abukir and Hogue, each carrying 755 men, were engaged in this work, when, without warning, the Abakir was overwhelmed by a flash of fire, a pillar of smoke, and a great geyser of water that rose from the sea and fell heavily upon her deck. This was instantly followed by a thundering explosion as the magazines of the doomed ship went off. Within a very few minutes, the Abakir sank, leaving the crew, crew floundering in the water. From the conning tower of the submarine, the captain, a man called Vedigan, had viewed the tragedy, and seeing the two sister ships speeding to the rescue, he quickly submerged. Hardly had they begun lowering their boats to rescue the stricken crew, when a torpedo from the unseen submarine struck the Hogue, and in twenty minutes she too had vanished beneath the waves. While she was sinking, the Cressy, with all guns ready for action, and her gunner scanning the sea in every direction for this deadly enemy, also suddenly felt the shock of a torpedo, and her magazines having been set off, she rapidly followed her sister ships to the ocean bed. So, in less than two hours, 36,000 tonnes of up-to-date British fighting machinery and 1,459 British seamen had been set sent to the depths of the North Sea by a little boat of only 450 tons carrying a crew of only 26 men. 
During the First World War, German U-boats racked up an astounding total of 2,439 Allied vessels sunk with a combined weight of 12,850,815 tonnes. However, 178 U-boats were also sunk in World War I, and this represented 50% of Germany's total U-boat capacity and resulted in the deaths of around 5,000 members of U-boat crew. This was U-118, which had surrendered at the end of the war. It was planned to be transferred to transfer her to France, but the tow line parted and she went aground off the Sussex coast. She, reached, she beached at Hastings in Sussex. So when the people of Hastings woke one morning to see this German U-boat on their beach, it caused something of a shock. These pictures give some idea of the size of these boats. They always look quite small when pictured afloat as most of the hull is underwater. These submarines were involved in so much havoc mayhem and death, but just to close this talk, a short story of man's humanity to man, even in times of war. On the 15th of September 1916, two Austrian flying boats had attacked the French submarine Foucault while she was on the surface. Three of the first four bombs caused severe damage to the submarine. She was leaking and out of trim, and subsequently she disappeared below beneath the surface. The crew of the submarine managed to blow all of the ballast tanks, and the submarine then rose to the surface. The submarine commander opened the hatch and clambered out, only to be faced by the two flying boats again diving to attack. The flying boats dropped four more bombs which burst dangerously close to the submarine. The French commander then ordered his men to abandon ship and the submarine was scuttled, at which point the two flying boats dropped all of their remaining bombs at a safe distance away from the submarine. The flying boats then landed on the surface of the water, taxied over to where the crew of the submarine were floating in the water, and the sailors were allowed to cling to the hulls and the floats of the flying boats until an Austrian torpedo boat arrived to pick them up. This was the very first recorded sinking of a submarine by attacking aircraft, and not a single life had been lost. Thank you for looking at this presentation, and I hope that you felt that it was an hour well spent in learning something of the history of the submarine.